and enjoys nature a lot. So, uh, so that includes the animals, but it also includes the plants, other things as well. And I'm kind of a teacher naturalist that I like to share my knowledge and experience with the world and nature with other people that like to learn a little bit more about that. So you may be a naturalist too, uh, so glad you came to this program. Obviously you have a little interest in the natural world because you're here to see this program, Hunters in the Sky, which uh, you kind of have a guess that it has something to do with wings and flying and all that kind of stuff, you know. So uh, you may be a naturalist at heart as well, okay. But welcome to the program once again. What we're going to do today, we're going to learn about these hunters in the sky, what most people refer to as birds of prey. So we've got several live birds of prey to show you. I'll be taking them out, walking around, talking a little bit about, about them. You know, if you have a real special question about the animal I'm talking about at the moment, you know, we'll try to take the time to have a question or two asked along the way. Uh, also, at the end of the program, I'll hang around for a while if you want to ask some more questions and that kind of stuff gets a little bit more information. And uh, welcome to the program, okay? Should probably be here about 45 minutes, an hour, or whatever. You need to get up and leave before we're done. I understand that, you know, okay? And, you know, a lot of times I do programs where I, uh, I do a lot of different kinds of wildlife programs, but a lot of times I do programs where I have animals that I like to let people touch. But this is different, okay? Today, today you will not be able to touch any of the things I brought because it's a legal thing. And they're also not pets, okay? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But usually I have a little space where I can walk out in the audience get a little bit closer to folks with things. But I'm going to stay up here behind this rope with all this stuff. I may be walking back and forth a little bit here, but I won't get too close to you and there will be no touching of the actual birds I brought today. And that is a legal thing. We'll talk more about that maybe in just a couple moments. So once again, welcome to the program, Hunters in the Sky, okay? All right, so I don't know what you think about hunters in the sky, but most people probably think of birds of prey, okay? And birds of prey also have the name raptors. You know, they're the birds that are very powerful. They hunt other animals for a living. You know, they're very fast flyers, very muscular, all that kind of stuff. But also, uh, hunters in the sky can include some other things as well. We're going to talk a little bit about that uh, as well. But we're going to start off with a typical hunter in the sky. Now, to get ready for this, I'm going to... Uh, probably bring this bird over and put it on this perch here because this bird I'm going to take out does not like to be held very much, okay? And uh, so when I'm using these birds, I have to use my special uh, assistant here, my glove, because all these birds have very sharp what we call talons. And talons are very sharp claws that belong to birds of prey or hundreds in the sky. So uh, that's one, one of their many characteristics. But we'll talk about some of their other characteristics as well. So let me grab this particular bird. <laughs> who is not the best behaved bird of my bunch, by the way. <laughs> Even though I've had her for like 20 years, and you know, and you would think she'd be really used to me and that kind of stuff. And, but uh, animals have this spirit. They have this wildness about them, you know. And the reason I have these birds to even show you are these are all birds that once lived in the wild, but now they live with man in captivity in enclosures. And I'll tell you more about why we have these birds here and why they cannot go out back to the wild where they should be. So kind of get nice and quiet as I bring this bird out. She's a little nervous. Okay, and we're going to take her over here, make her feel a little more at home on a tree branch over here. Okay. okay, all right. Now let's hope she'll turn around and face you. So that's not your best side. Let's turn around, flip the other way. But that's. That's pretty typical for her. She's a difficult bird, let's put it that way. <laughs> You're not inspiring all right now. Okay, here we go. Let's start over. All right, let's do this right this time. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay, so let's talk about this bird. By the way, my birds often poop, as birds do. And if it, if it hits the carpet, I'll be cleaning the carpet before I leave. But we try to put down a little protection here. Uh, but uh, does anybody know what kind of bird or hunter in the sky this is? A red hawk. Okay, this is called a red tail hawk. Now, red tail hawks normally have these beautiful red tail feathers, okay? And uh, this particular bird, this is the time of year when a lot of times they molt their tail feathers. And so her tail feathers look pretty terrible right now. But we can't let you touch the bird. But what I am going to do, I'm going to pass around this nice tail feather of a red tail hawk. Just be sure I get it back at the end of the program. But I'm going to pass that around, so just take that and pass it around to people. And, you know, birds of prey are named for some attribute they have or something they you know, appear to be or whatever. And the red tail hawk 
is an apt example of that because they do have reddish brown tail feathers. Okay, and so that's a red brown tail feather. It's not a bright red like you might think, but it almost looks like it's glowing red because when you see a red tail hawk flying in the sky, the sun is shining down from above, and below we see the bottom of the tail. It looks like it's glowing red. But actually, the underneath of the tail feathers are not as red as the top part is. So it's a little bit of an optical illusion. But you know, if you see a red tail hawk that has red, reddish tail feathers, that is a mature red tail hawk because they only get those in about the second year of life. That's when they get to the adult size. Before that, they may be the full size they are, but they may not have those red tail feathers, so they may resemble a lot of other hawks. So you may see a lot of red tail hawks that don't look like red tail hawks. It's just because they're young red tail hawks, okay? So red tails on a red tail hawk are a sign of maturity, kind of like white hair on a human is a sign of maturity, hopefully, <laughs> with most of us. Okay, all right, because I used to have brown hair. <laughs> okay, so let's talk more about the red tail hawk uh, as a bird of prey, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the red-tailed hawk as a species. So this is a great example of what a bird of prey kind of looks like. You know, they all have these certain features. So the first thing, when you look at a bird of prey, if you're lucky enough to see one up close, which is not very often, one of the first things you'll notice is their beak. Their beak is long and curved downward, and it's got a very sharp point on the end there, okay? And you might think that's their major weapon, but it's not. Their major weapon are their talons or their toenails. They're needle sharp at the end, and even though they look like chicken feet with very sharp t claws, the legs themselves actually have very large tendons and strong muscles, so they actually protect themselves by using their talons, by grasping something, something's trying to hurt them, but they also use those to capture their food. So number one thing about birds of prey is they capture their food primarily by grabbing it with their very sharp talons and very strong feet, okay? Now, the beak of the bird there is very sharp and recurved, and that's not actually for catching the prey. You know, a lot of birds have a beak that's designed for catching the prey, so you look at, say, a woodpecker. It's got a chisel-like beak for pecking into the wood so you can bore down and get to the insects. You find some little songbirds that have a little tweezer-like beak for grabbing little bugs and stuff like that. Other birds have big cracking beaks for cracking open seeds and nuts and stuff like that. But these, the, the, this bird uses that beak there to tear apart its food into little bitty pieces because many birds of prey, there are some that like to swallow their food whole if it's small enough, but red-tailed hawks are big enough, they prey on things that are big enough that they can't swallow it whole like some other birds do, and they have to, uh, pick it in little pieces. So they use their beak like a knife and a fork and tear the prey apart once they've killed it. And that's usually killing it with their talons. And uh, if their death doesn't come from being grabbed by the talons, they'll take their beak and maybe break the backbone of a creature or something like that. So very sharp talons for strong feet, very specialized beak for tearing apart their food. Another thing, if you look at most birds of prey, like this red-tailed hawk, when you look at it, you notice it's very attentive. It watches every little detail, doesn't it? Because if you're a predator, which means you hunt other animals for a living, you have to be ready at the moment's notice to swoop down and grab your prey. So this bird is always watching every little movement out there, okay? Don't worry, this bird is not thinking of you as food. You're too big, and you don't look like the things they like to feed on, okay? But they have very sharp eyesight, and their eyesight, it's been said that a red-tailed hawk in particular, because it is a daytime bird, it actually has color vision, believe it or not, like we do, uh, most birds do, but it's been claimed that their vision is so good that in comparison to a human being, it could be like this bird could be at one end of a football field at the goalpost and be able to read the fine print of a newspaper at the far end. In other words, obviously birds like this don't read papers, but that's how acute their eyesight, how keen their eyesight is. So they can sit somewhere on a perch, waiting for minutes or hours on the end, sitting really stu still, just moving their heads, watching and watching and waiting, and then suddenly they swoop down on something they see that's maybe hundreds of yards away. So once they get to the prey, they also have to get there pretty fast, don't they? Because the prey may not be very close. So most birds of prey are very, very fast in flight as well. Fast flyers, powerful talons, great eyesight, specialized beaks and claws. And also, if you look at this red-tailed hawk, you notice in comparison to his face, his eyes are pretty big, so it takes in a pretty big image. But also, you know, it's got a kind of like a tough guy look. You know, if you look at birds of prey like hawks that are daytime hunters, they have a little brow over their eye. And if you go out on a bright, sunny day, and the sun's kind of bright, you might put your hand over your eye to kind of see in the distance, shield yourself from the sun. You might wear a cap or something, you know, or a little sun visor. So you're trying to shield your eyes from the sun so you can see detail. So nature has their built-in brow line on birds like hawks, 
so they can see great distances and block out the sun and see those tiny little things that they take advantage of that they're going to eat. So those are just some of the characteristics that birds of prey have. Now, if you're a bird of prey, you eat other creatures. But if that was true that all you had to do would be a predator and eat other creatures, that would mean a bluebird would be a bird of prey. Because bluebirds eat crickets and grasshoppers and stuff like that. But also in the wintertime when the insects are out, bluebirds eat things like little fruits and berries, right? You know? And the same thing can be said about a robin tugging an wor earthworm out of the ground or something. In the wintertime, you, they, they can't find things like that, so they eat fruits and berries, you know? But just because you eat something else does not make you a bird of prey. You have to have a special combination of features. And you might think that all birds of prey are very large. That's not true either. Some birds of prey are very, very small, and some are very, very large, and a lot of sizes in between there, okay? So those are just some typical things about uh, these birds you need to know. Before we talk a little bit more about red-tailed hawks in general, I want to mention something else about the birds of prey I brought. All the birds of prey I brought here are protected by law, which means that you cannot possess a feather, you can't have a live one or a dead one without a special permit, you know, and the reason these things are so highly protected is that a long time ago, there were no laws to protect any kind of wildlife in North America or anywhere else in the world for that matter. And if you wanted a pretty feather from a bird, you could just go out and shoot one, you know. And people did that often. Back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there were a lot of birds, including little bitty hummingbirds, large birds of prey, shorebirds and water birds like egrets and other that were shot and killed just for their feathers for the fashion trade. And women used to like wear these fancy hats, these big long feathers that would stick out. They'd pin actually a dead, a dead hummingbird that was preserved to their to the dress or lapel as a little, you know, a little corsage type thing. And because of that, the market hunting, these people would go out and hunt and kill hundreds and thousands of these birds of all different types. And bird populations were plummeting. And many were coming very close to extinction. And many were becoming very endangered. So back around the early 1900s, they started to pass some laws to protect some of our native wildlife. And certain things can be hunted now particular things like deer, bear, and wild turkey. But a lot of our birds are not hunted, and birds of prey are never hunted. They're totally protected by law. So I have to have a special permit for this bird even to come to see you today. And the reason I can have this bird come to see you today is because this bird and all the other birds I'm going to show you today can no longer live in the wild. And when I take each of them out, you might want to look and see if you can see what their so-called disability is, okay? Because even though they're powerful predators, they can still get injured. And if it affects your ability to capture your food, then you're not going to be able to make a living as a predator very long. Okay? So this is, we call this bird Rita. I call her Rita, the red-tailed hawk. She is a female. And the way you tell male and female birds that are hawks and their other cousins in the wild is usually the males are a little smaller than the female of the same species. And she's a pretty big bird. Okay? Now, a lot of times you may think they look bigger, that's because you're seeing them flying and they're spreading their wings out, what we call the wingspan. So the average wingspan of a, say, a, probably a male red-tailed hawk would be represented by that flying silhouette right there, that shape of that bird. That's a red-tailed hawk. So we can often tell the shapes of birds from a distance, what they are and what size they are. But males are usually smaller than the females. Rita is a, is a, a female, a big heavy female. And if you look at her, other than she's got some ratty looking tail feathers right now because it's time for her to molt those tail feathers and get new ones in, does anybody see anything that looks like is wrong with her that makes her not able to live in a while? What do you think? Yeah, I'll see. I see some of her feathers on her body. Okay, well, it is a time when they molt some of their feathers, but they never molt all their feathers all at once. So it's not her feathers, but that's a good guess. What do you think? Her wing. Okay, she does have a problem with the wing. Can you see that one wing looks a little bit different than the other? Okay, so, you know, if you're a bird and you fly, your wings are very important, you know. And uh, if you're, you know, there's some birds that spend a lot of time on the ground, like turkeys and stuff like that, but they still fly up in the trees and sit there at night and get away from predators. But if you're a predatory bird and you don't fly very well, you're going to start missing your meals and you're going to starve. So about 20 years ago, this bird was found on the ground doing just that, starving. And it was very weak. It couldn't fly. One wing was a little bit lower than the other. Uh, make a long story short, it was brought into captivity, examined, and it was realized that this, one of its wings had been broken at some point in time, and all the bone ends kind of came back together and created a bunch of scar tissue, and there was nothing you could do about it because the wing had already healed up. And the big thing is, how many of you ever had a broken bone in your body, like an arm or a leg or something like that? You know, you know, it takes a while to get over that. But your bone will probably heal in maybe, what, six, eight weeks or something, and you might have to wear a cast or a sling for a little bit longer or something. But if a bird breaks its bones, 
somewhere like in a swing, they can heal up in as little as 10 days to two weeks because they have a lot of hollow spaces in their bone to make them light enough to fly. But if the bones don't match each other or something, then it's going to heal crooked. You can get what we call scar tissue, and you'll have a permanent wing injury. So that's what happened to Rita. We think that she probably got hit by a car, and that's what caused that, because on x-ray, the way the wing looks. And you might think that's unusual, but as a wildlife rehabilitator, which means I have a special permit, so I work with animals that are injured and orphaned, and hopes we can get them back into the wild. I work a lot with birds of prey. One of the most things I see the very most is wildlife rehabilitator and injury with birds of all types, but particularly birds of prey, is that they have been hit by cars. You might think they'd be hit by airplanes. No, hit by cars, you know. And you might wonder why that is, because uh, I'll tell you, you know a good place to see a hawk? Go out along the highway. Drive down the highway, particularly in the countryside, you know, be very careful you're driving, but keep looking in the trees around the edges of the highway where it's kind of open. We have a little woods, but you have little meadows and fields and stuff like that, or just the sides of the roads that are mowed all the time, you know, you'll see little animals there. You'll see snakes occasionally. You'll see big insects. You'll see rabbits there, which means that things that eat those kinds of things will hunt there. So red-tailed hawks in particular like to sit in trees near highways and open areas and spot something and swoop down to get it, and they may swoop right in front of a car and get hit by a car. Many of them get killed. Very few of them get rescued. But some that get rescued like this will never be able to go back in a while because we cannot fix that wing. So she was slowly starving, her wing and healed crooked, but we can't fix that. But uh, many of these birds hunt near the highway, okay? So that is Rita the red-tailed hawk's uh, issue right there, okay? So great looking, typical looking bird of prey, sitting very still, they're out there, look for them. Anybody have any questions about red-tailed hawks before we go into another hunter in the sky? Yes? So she hasn't moved her head much. Does mm -hmm. that mean her eyes fully rotate around? Okay, her eyes, you know, a lot of birds of prey don't have a lot of muscles to move their eyes around a lot, so they're kind of fixing their socks, so they move their head more than they do their eye. I mean, they blink their eye a lot, but the eye itself doesn't really move much, you know. But she's sitting really still, paying attention to what's going on here. And by the way, you'll see red-tailed hawks out in the open country more than you will deep in the woods because there are different kinds of hawks, different groups. There's a group of hawks called Buteos. And Buteos are like red-tailed hawks and their cousins that have very long wings, but they're kind of wide, but they're open soaring hawks. They like to hunt things in open country, and you often see them soaring in the sky. They ride warm air currents, and they ride upwards in the sky and go higher and higher and higher. But they like open country. Those are called Buteos, okay? And she's getting a little bit nervous because we have some people kind of moving around in there. She kind of got comfortable and then got a little bit of movement there. So if you kind of stay kind of still here, I'm going to grab her and put her back in her uh, carrier here. And we'll move on to our next uh, hunter in the sky. By the way, you know, red-tailed hawks are probably the most common bird of prey or hunter in the sky you'll probably see in most areas. They're very adaptable and because we have a lot of neighborhoods, a lot of highways that have been cut through the countryside, there's a lot of open country that's very conducive for them to hunt and find their prey. And of course, red-tailed hawks will eat a lot of things. They'll eat rabbits. They might eat a groundhog. Uh, a lot of times they eat snakes. But anything they can catch basically is something that they will eat. Okay, alright. So we're going to take out another hawk now. And this is a little bit different hawk than a red-tailed hawk. And this is a member of the same group, what we call Buteos. So it's kind of like a smaller version of a red-tailed hawk. But there's some very unusual, interesting things I'm going to tell you about this next type of uh, hunter in the sky. Over to the safety of the. Would you like to sit up here too? Or would you like just hang there? There we go. All right. Okay. All right. So this kind of looks like a red tail hawk, just in miniature form, but it doesn't have red tail feathers. And this is a hawk called a broad winged hawk. So in flight, it looks a lot like a red tail hawk would from a distance, just much, much smaller. 
and maybe the wings are a little bit shorter. And there's some very unusual things about broad winged hawks. Where are you going? <laughs> maybe you'd be more comfortable just standing on my hand. Maybe not. Easy does it. She just banged her eye on the perch there, so she got a little spot there. I'll just sit her right here, maybe she'll be more comfortable. So what happens with red, uh, broadwing hawks are, in the win middle of the winter time, they are not here. Hawks and a lot of other birds are what we call migratory birds. And they move from one place to another, depending on the time of the year. And broadwing hawks have a tendency to a lot of little reptiles and things like that, which are cold-blooded creatures, which you don't see much in the wintertime. So broadwing hawks in our area here, about the middle of September, all the broadwing hawks in North America here basically start heading south, and they almost all of them end up winding up down in the country, uh, continent of South America. You know, that's thousands of miles away. And they more normally do that in a period, this very short period of time. And around this area here, if you come out and look in about the middle of the third or fourth week of September, you can sometimes see hundreds or even thousands of broadwing hawks migrating south in a, in a day. And there's always a peak period of time, a two or three day period, where most of them come through. We have them coming through from up in the northeast United States, passing through here, plus the ones that actually live here. And they're coming through in such large numbers is very noticeable, but also they have a very special thing that they do that's really cool. They form what are called kettles. And on a good warm day, about mid to late morning, as warm air rises up off the surface of the earth in mid to late September, all the hawks that are migrating, like the broadwing hawks, they'll catch a little lift of this air. We call those thermals. It's like a column of air that's just rising up thousands of feet. So a lot of times they have to migrate up and over our mountains here in, in North and South Carolina, and they're heading south, and if they just flap their wings all the time going south, they wear themselves out. But a lot of times they glide, and one way they can glide is to get altitude so they can glide down and pick up another thermal. So they'll get in these thermals in a tight thermal or column of air, and you'll have several hundred or even a thousand of them swirling around in a very tight mass as if they're in a kettle, like a pot boiling on a stove, like you're making soup or something like that, and all the ingredients were twisting and turning, okay? So these little birds, they'll get in there, and that's the most amazing sight, and they'll ride those thermals up several thousand feet until you can't even see them, and the warm air runs out, and then they start gliding out one after another until they fit another thermal, and that lifts them up thousands of feet, and they go down on their trip south to uh, South America. So that's an arduous migration, and of course many of them suffer injuries and things like that as they go south. Now this little broadwing hawk here, uh, I don't know the complete story about it because it was, came from another wildlife rehabilitation facility over in Tennessee, but if you were to look closely, if it was perched and kind of relaxed, one of its wings would also kind of droop down. Which probably means when we see a wing that's drooping, you know, we normally know that that wing has probably been injured somehow. And on x-ray, the same thing that happened to Rita probably happened to this bird. This bird probably was hit by a car because when they're here during the warmer months of the year before they migrate, they sit on power lines, trees, along the highway, searching for food, just like red-tailed hawks do, and they often fly down and get hit by cars. So that is a very, very common problem. So think about that when you're driving down the road. Drive a little slower, you know, and uh, maybe you can avoid something like that if a hawk suddenly flies down to grab something. So uh, broadwing hawk, just kind of a smaller version of the red-tailed hawk, also what we call a buteo. But there are some other hawks that you might see that are small, like this, or even smaller, but they might have longer tails and they're a little bit more streamlined. They are called occipiter hawks. That's another group of hunters in the sky. And they have, they have very uh, great mobility to twist and turn. And these are hawks that you would see deep in the woods. They, and they actually hunt other birds primarily. And they actually catch other birds sometimes in mid-air because they're able to twist and turn so quickly to do that. And they're called occipiters. The two that we have around here that are most common are things called sharp shin hawks and this larger variety called the cooper's hawk. And if you ever have a bird feeder at your house and you see a hawk swoop down trying to get birds at your bird feeder, probably one of those two, the sharp shin hawk or the cooper's hawk because they are bird-eating predator birds, okay? So those are the 
two basic groups of hawks that we have in our area, the occipiters and the buteos, okay? All right, so there is another hawk species that you may have heard about, or a couple others. I don't have represented them with me today, but there are other hawks that are very specialized. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of those groups are called falcons. Falcons are actually specialized hawks that have very sharp wing tips. They're kind of like little fighter jets. They often catch your food in mid-air as well. And probably the most uh, well-known falcon is probably the peregrine falcon. Okay, And the peregrine falcon is amazing because it looks a little bit different from some of these other birds of prey, but it is a daytime hawk species. It just has some different uh, adaptations. But they actually capture your food in midair, not by catching it with their talons. They ball their feet up and they normally hit it with their feet like a bullet because they dive down on a target and dive at speeds of up to and over 200 miles per hour. That's faster than most winds of a tornado. Can you imagine being hit by something going 200 miles per hour? You'd probably be dead on impact, wouldn't you? So that's how they hunt other birds. They just bop them in the sky with their fist, hit them that fast, that other thing tumbles to the ground, they fly down, and then they have a meal. So you see peregrine falcons every once in a while around here. But also you might see their smaller cousin very commonly. If you're driving down the road somewhere, out, in, out, in a, out away from town a little bit, or sometimes even close to town, and you see a lone bird all by itself, you know, that looks about the size of a fat robin. Everybody knows what a robin is. That might be our smallest falcon called the kestrel, which looks like a miniature peregrine falcon, but it eats insects, mice, and doesn't bop things in midair like its larger cousin, the peregrine, does. So falcons are found in our area too. And then the largest hawk species of all is called the eagle. And everybody gets very excited when they see eagles, right? because they have wingspans like six feet or more, you know. But they're actually large specialized hawks. And only one of them routinely is in our area called the bald eagle, which is, of course, our nation's uh, national emblem, okay. So you may be lucky enough to see one of those. They pass through here, and there are some breeding populations not far away from here as well, okay. All right, so we're going to turn from the uh, hawks into one more hunter in the sky that comes out in the daytime, then we're going to visit a nighttime hunter in the sky, okay? Now this next bird is a hunter in the sky, but it is a very controversial bird, okay? And some people eat, don't even consider it to be a uh, bird of prey. So I heard somebody say that this is a turkey what? Turkey vulture. Turkey vulture, right. Okay, all right. So this is a pretty big bird, isn't it? Okay. Now, when you look at a vulture, which some people call buzzards, do they look like a bird of prey to you? No. No. You don't think so? No. They've got, a, they've got a pretty big bird. They've got a big wingspan. They've got a uh, very sharp beak. But they also have some other adaptation characteristics that are not typical of a bird of prey, okay? And one of the things you look at, first of all, is their head. Now, they don't have any feathers on their head. There's a reason for that, you know? And uh, their beak, even though it looks like some of these other birds of prey, is a little bit longer, and also they have huge nostril openings, which other birds of prey don't. So the reason some people don't think this is not a bird of prey is because this bird doesn't hunt other living creatures it actually feeds on things that are already dead. So it's a scavenger. But if you get a book on birds of prey, you'll find that the vultures, like the turkey vulture and his cousin, the black vulture, which is also found around here, are almost always listed in a book about birds of prey. But scientists study them, and the more they study them, they claim that they're probably more closely related to storks. Believe it or not, just storks. You know, which are kind of water birds, right? You know? Okay, but they don't eat live prey primarily. They eat things that are already dead. And they also find the things that are dead by their sense of smell, which birds of prey don't have. Birds of prey find their food by the movement of it because it's living. Birds like this find their food by smell because it's dead and starting to decay and rot, believe it or not. So that makes them very efficient in finding their prey. Let's put 
Velma the vulture right here for a moment, as we call her. Okay. So uh, Velma is a great example of the turkey vulture. And if you look very closely, you might see what is her issue. What is her problem? She can't be released a while. Can anybody notice it? Full back. Not on your best side. Everybody's out here? Did you notice what was... Okay. What if her wings actually has a hump in it when she sits kind of like, if she gets still there, her wing on her right got a little extra hump in it and then also droops down. So Velma, we think, probably was also hit by a car. Now that makes a little more sense with vultures because where is an easy, great place to find lots of things that are dead? On the highway, unfortunately. You drive dead highway, you're going to see dead possums, you're going to see dead raccoons, dead deer, all kinds of things out there, dead squirrels. And that's exactly what they like to feed on, okay? But it's a kind of a dangerous place to eat your meals at, you know? So sometimes vultures will grab something in the road, it's small, they'll pull it over to the side of the road, but they may get hit by a car. But they don't seem to get hit by cars as much as other birds because, like, if you're a hawk or something, you swoop down, you're just suddenly there and you, you're surprised somebody's driving. The vultures are already there on the ground and they're big, but sometimes when they see a car, they come jumping up trying to fly away because of the movement scares them, and then they might get hit by a car. But uh, Velma was found somewhere. Uh, she used to live in Tennessee, and uh, she was at a wildlife rehabilitation facility there, and she was deemed unreasonable because of her wing, and she has no flight ability whatsoever. She lives in a big outdoor cage, but she has a little perch that goes to one after another, like steps to get up high to a perch where she sleeps at night. But she has no flight ability at all. And even though vultures spend a lot of time on the ground feeding on things dead, they still have to fly many miles to get to their next meal, you know? So Velma can no longer live in a while. When she was found, she was slowly starving to death. And, uh, but she's doing much better now. Now, you might wonder why a vulture has a bald head. Does anybody know why? They have a bald head because it's easy to keep clean because what they feed on are dead animals. And dead animals are rotting. And they're gooey and nasty smelling. And sometimes the vulture, they stick their heads way down deep inside the carcasses of those animals to get all the meat off the bones. And that means they're going to have a lot of gunk on their heads. So if they had feathers like other birds, that'd be a mess to take care of, wouldn't it? But a bald head allows their head to stay pretty clean. And anything gets on their head, where they go out and sun themselves, it just bakes off and dries off. You'll see a vulture sometimes out spreading its wings in the sunshine, speeding up its metabolism because of dark color absorbs heat. So they can actually eat things that have a lot of bacteria in them and things that would actually poison other animals and make them sick or even kill them. So vultures are considered to be very, very beneficial because of that. Okay? So vultures are a great animal to have around because of what they feed on and how they do it, okay? And I've had Velma the vulture for about 20 years here. And uh, you might ask me, uh, Carlton, what does Velma like to eat? And she likes to eat the same things he used to eat. Dead animals off the road. So if you see a little truck driving down and somebody jumps out, grabs a dead squirrel out of the road or something like that, throws it in the back of the truck and drives off, chances are it might be me. Picking up Velma's next meal, but uh, don't don't bring me road kills that aren't fresh, you know. And so even though they can eat something that's rotting and pretty nasty in a while, I only bring home fresh squirrels for Velma. She's gotten particular now that she's in captivity. Okay, all right. But she's a great bird. A vulture is a great animal to have around, and uh, we can recognize turkey vultures by the fact they have that reddish head. They have a cousin called the black vulture has a black head, and that's one of the ways you can tell them apart up close. Do we have a question over here? Somebody's hand went up. Question? No, no, no. Okay. Any other questions about vultures? Yes. Yeah. You mentioned um, that they go a good ways for meals. How, how far do vultures range? How far do they range? You'll find these vultures all the way down to like Central, uh, South America, Central America. If he lives in the backyard, how Oh, okay. We, it, it's all food related. So it may just stay in a general neighborhood, but also vultures, like other birds of prey, will migrate. And even though we have vultures all winter long, it may not be the same vulture you saw in the summertime. But it's all food related, but they generally have a general localized area where they're going to kind of hang out in as long as food is available. Roughly, yeah, as long as food is available there. Yeah. Yes? What's their lifespan? Well, 
in captivity, animals can often live longer than they would in the wild because they're taken care of. But in the wild, being a predator, you know, when you get older, you slow down and things eat you. So in the wild, you know, some of our birds have probably been known to live 10, 15, or 20 years in the wild, but that's kind of rare. But in captivity, a lot of birds of prey can live to be 20, 25, or even 30 years of age, believe it or not. Question right here. Yes. Uh huh. I saw her legs looking look kind of funny? Well, she has a funny little walk. Because the way she walks, you know, she just kind of creeps along and she doesn't walk like a hawk would on the ground. Hawks on the ground, they have a tendency to kind of hop, but she kind of has a little stalking walk. You know, so. But her legs are actually fine. So. Yes? Uh, vultures like to roost in places where you almost never find their nest, but it's usually somewhere on the ground or something like that. It could be like if you have a big pile of boulders you know, in a crevice or something like that, a little rock shelter. I've seen vultures nest in old abandoned houses and things like that, you know, that people don't ever go in. Some really remote area of the woods, you know. But they don't build a big nest up in a tree. Yeah, yeah. But they're very good at remaining hidden. But vultures are pretty common. You see them a lot passing overhead. And it's almost like you never see their nest, but there's a lot of vultures. They're very adaptable and can often live close to people. Okay, so we're going to let Velma the vulture go back in. So I consider Velma and her cousins to be hunters in the sky because they fly back and forth in the sky looking for their food, smelling their food. But since they feed on things that are dead, I guess I wouldn't put them in the category of being a bird of prey, but definitely a hunter in the sky. All right. Now we got one more hunter in the sky to show you and talk about, and this next one is a nighttime hunter in the sky. So far, all these other guys we've seen are daytime hunters in the sky, but there are hunters in the sky in the night. Okay. So let's visit with one of those. Okay, so I'm going to get over here in just a moment because this bird almost always when I take it out and I stop he likes to raise his tail and poop, so I'm just waiting. You may not today, but just in case. And when he poops, it's pretty, pretty bad smelling. A lot of animals defend themselves when they, they poop because it smells bad and it kind of repels a predator or something that might harm them. And even birds of prey do have predators, believe it or not. Okay? So you're not going to do anything? We're good? Nope. We're good? Maybe. I don't trust you, but we'll go try it. We'll walk over here. Maybe just for a little extra insurance, I'll lay another thing here just in case. Okay, all right. So does anybody recognize this type of bird? What is it? Okay, it's an owl, owl, okay? So owls are nocturnal or nighttime birds of prey. Does anybody know what kind of owl this is? Owl. What's that? This is a barred owl. And I'm going to spell that for you. In fact, I'm going to show you how it's spelled because a lot of people get confused when they see this bird. This is called the barred owl. Not barn owl, but barred. Oh, boy. Was it, lucky I brought that over here, right? Okay. Well, that's kind of exciting. How many, how many ever got to see an owl poop before? Probably not. Yeah. All right. But barred owl, B-A-R-R-E-D, is named for the little bars or the little patterns on its feathers there. And there is another owl called the barn owl, B-A-R-N. The B-A-R-N, the barn owl, actually is an owl that's somewhat common in this country right around Landrum area and, and uh, upstate South Carolina in this open area here where we have a lot of fields and pastures. I actually live up in the mountains of West North Carolina and it's not very common up there because it's not a forest bird. This is a forest bird. But barn owls, B-A-R-N, actually like to stay in old barns and buildings during the daytime behind the hay bales and raise their young in little nesting situations there. But barn owls are common where there's a lot of woods. They raise their young in hollow tree cavities 
and then they fly in the woods hunting for food at night. So they kind of have very, two very different habitats. But the barred owl is one of my favorites of all because, you know, owls are so mysterious. And we don't see them as much. I mean, raise your hand if you've ever seen a daytime bird, like a hawk, uh, you know, falcon, vulture, eagles. You know, almost everybody's probably raised their hand. But if I asked you to raise your hand if you've ever seen an owl, probably not as many of you would be able to raise your hand because they're mostly active after night. And most of us, where we at night, we're at home, you know. So unless you spend a lot of time outdoors, like camping or something like that, you may not see owls very often. Sometimes you hear them, but you may not see them because they are very vocal at calling for their mates, okay? And we'll talk more about their calls here in just a moment. But what makes a bird of prey a bird of prey is true for the owl here. It's got these very sharp talons. It's got very strong feet. It's got a fast, strong flight. It's got great eyesight, except its eyesight is designed to see things in the darkness. And it's got a beak like other birds of prey do too. But it also looks very different. Their eyes are much bigger for the size head, and their head is huge, and their heads almost always have a little rounded disc to them. And the reason they have a rounded disc is because even though they're a great bird of prey and have all these other features, they find a lot of their food not only by sight, but by sound. So they don't have any ears that stick out like we do to catch sound, but they have a rounded face which acts like a cup-shaped ear, and little sounds in the dark that are things that they might be able to feed on are transmitted to the face and it goes down under the feathers to big ear openings under the feathers that you cannot see and they can often pinpoint their prey from the distance away without actually seeing it. In fact, the barn owl I mentioned earlier, B-A-R-N, is known for actually hovering in midair over a field or pasture where there's tall grass pointing his head down, not seeing what it's hunting but listening swooping down and coming up with a little mouse or something without actually seeing it. Barred owls probably use their sight a little bit more, but also they use their hearing as well. So they're an amazing predator in the dark, being able to see things as well as hear them and use all those senses to grab things in the dark. Okay, so that's why their faces are rounded. Also, owls have a very quiet flight. So they have little fringes on their feather that muffle the wind. So, you know, you might see other birds flap their wings and stuff, you hear sounds, and some birds actually make little whistling sounds they fly. But owls have a totally silent, ghost-like flight. So imagine you're a little creature that an owl likes to feed on, like a little mouse or something. And you're out there looking around, you've got good ears, you've got good hearing and stuff like that, and, but you're looking around and it's, oh! so suddenly, out of nowhere, you're grabbed by an owl. You never saw it coming, you never heard it coming, because it was silent, and death is very quick. So they're very, very efficient predators things out there. Also, they have a great ability to move their heads. Now, notice this owl is pretty much looking over his head like completely backwards, right? Some people think an owl can turn his head 360 degrees, but that's not quite true. 270 degrees, three-fourths of a circle, but that's three times further than you can turn your head. But most birds of prey can do that, believe it or not. In fact, owls, I mean, uh, uh, hawks by daytime they see very well, but they can't see at night. And at night they sleep, but they turn their heads completely backwards and tuck their heads under their feathers, kind of like a chicken does, and sleeps that way, you know. But owls can see in the daytime, and they can see at night as well, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about barred owls. Now, on the count of three, I want you to give me your best, what you think an owl like a barred owl might sound like, okay? So one, two, three. Okay, so I'm hearing a lot of kind of rooting sounds out there. And it is true that some owls hoot. Do you know that a lot of owls don't know how to hoot? Many owls actually do not hoot, but we think that all owls do, but a lot don't. But the barred owl is one of the ones that does hoot. But it has a very specialized hoot. And I'm going to teach you to sound like a barred owl. Because if you want to see a barred owl, you might need to go out and make a sound like an owl so they can answer you back and maybe come investigate you. We call that going on an owl prowl. You play a recording of an owl sound and they may answer you or if you can imitate it yourself, you can do it yourself. But barn owls have a very specialized call and it starts off as very rhythmic. And a lot of people say it sounds like the owl is saying, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Can you say that? Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? 
but it's a little bit more of a blurry thing. It doesn't sound like they're really saying it. It's just a rhythm. So uh, when it comes out of Al, it sounds a little more like, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? So it's a very haunting call. And you'll hear that in the woods sometimes, particularly if you live near water, or at least the owls live near water. They like to be around wetlands that have woods with water because they eat a lot of things. Not only do they eat mice and things like that, but they also eat crayfish and small fish and frogs. And you'll find all that kind of stuff near wetlands, okay? But uh, we have several different kinds of owls that live in the area. The very smallest is called a solid owl, about the size of my fist. About the size of my hand is one called the screech owl. It is very close to people. Then we have the barn owl you've heard about. We have the barred owl we're looking at. And then even bigger than that, if one was sitting in my hand, it would be about this tall, it would be the great horned owl. And those are the most common owls that we have that live in this area. Now, has anybody spotted anything wrong with uh, the barred owl here? Probably, it looks pretty good to me. What do you think? There is something wrong with his wing, but it doesn't look that bad compared to the others. But what happened to this bird? This bird used to live here in South Carolina. And a guy I know now, I didn't know him then, but he was coming home from a deer hunting trip in South Carolina, and uh, he saw this very owl you're looking at, it was in the road. And his head was tilted to one side, his wing was stretched out, he'd been hit by a car. Yeah, it seems like all the birds I brought here have been hit by cars. That's, that's the main thing that happens to you, you know. So uh, the bird was not flying off. He had a concussion, which was a blow to the head. It could easily kill him. But his worst injury was his wingtip was almost completely severed. Just a little bit of his wingtip was hanging on by a little bit of tissue. And luckily, he made a few phone calls, found me. Make another long story short, Harry, as he nicknamed him, made a complete recovery, but his wing doesn't work like it used to. It doesn't flex at the tip there where the injury was. So it hangs down just a little bit. So he's got just a little bit of a flight disability. And if you're a hunter in the sky and you don't have the best flight ability, then you're going to start missing meals and you're going to start starving to death. So that's what happened with Harry, as he nicknamed. By the way, I don't know if this is Harry. It could be Harriet because boy and girl owls look alike pretty much, except the boys are usually a bit smaller than the girls, but with barred owls, a little harder to tell than some of the others. But, so this is Harry or Harriet, the barred owl. Do we have a question about owls right here? Yeah, okay. I have an owl book. You do have an owl book? That's yeah, pretty cool. Three baby owls um, said they lost their mama, but they really didn't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Qu another question. When did you rescue them? What? When did you rescue them? Uh, I've had this owl about, about nine years now, I guess. Yeah, so I've had him about that long. And the next question most people say was, how long do owl, owls live? Well, like I mentioned earlier, some of these birds will live 15 or 20 years in a while, but most don't. But in captivity, they can live a lot longer. Okay. Any other questions about owls? Yes. On the vocalization and stuff, what's the one that almost laughs and when the, the young owls start taking off, it's like... Yeah, well, these often do a lot of other sounds. So their standard call is that, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. But they'll make monkey-like, <laughs> sounds like that as well. Yeah, and they make human-like screams when they're frightened by things, believe it or not. And they make screeches or wailing sounds. And, and uh, so they're one of my favorite owls because they make so many odd and unusual sounds. Another question, yes. Why is the poop so stinky? Why is the poop so sneaky? Stinky. Oh, stinky. <laughs> well, poop, I guess so you won't go near it. You know, so if a bird like this sees something that frightens him, he poops, that's kind of, kind of going to repel something that might harm him, okay? But, uh, so you don't think smells very, I don't I agree. And it may be poop because of what he eats. You know, they like to eat mice and stuff. And animals that eat other animals usually have a much stinkier poop than animals that eat plants. You know, you know so like a deer poop or rabbit poop is not nearly as bad as that kind of a poop there, you know, okay? All right, All right. so that's Harry the barred owl. Huh? Talk about their colors. Okay, so that is owl poop, but what owls do with certain things is they also cough up what's called a pellet. So since owls often eat things that are small enough for them to swallow whole, like mice, <clears throat> they cannot digest the bones and the feathers and the fur, and it can't come out their rear end because the opening is too small. Only liquid waste comes out of a bird, as you see right there. So the bigger stuff they can't digest has to come out the same way it went in, through the mouth. 
So usually like once a day, an owl in his stomach will form this pellet of old bones, feathers if it ate a bird, fur, teeth, claws, skulls, whatever, you know, and they'll sit and just pop up this pellet, and it's on the ground there. And that's pretty interesting because you can pick them apart and see what owls eat, have eaten. And a lot of science classes order owl pellets from suppliers, and you pick them apart and you find out what owls eat, dissect an owl pellet. You know? But actually, all birds of prey pop up pellets. It's just that owls do it more often because many owls eat things that are small enough for them to swallow a hole, which means they're eating the bones, the feathers, the fur, all that kind of stuff. Whereas a lot of the hawks, they like to pick their food and pick the meat off of the bones and they don't often swallow the bones, but if they do swallow the bones of feathers, then they will cough up a pellet as well. But all birds of prey, hunters in the sky, will pop up pellets. Yes? Um, uh, okay. Were you going to say that you dissected one? Or yeah, I, I dissected one. Oh, um, yeah? And I found a hole. Mama! Mama! Oh, yeah. And I had a hole in my skull. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? What you can find there. So, you know, one of the big things that I want to end with is uh, birds of prey, you know, they're very unique birds. The hunters in the sky, they're wonderful creatures, you know, but they are vulnerable to a lot of things happening to them. And they live in a modern world that's becoming increasingly more modern. More highways, more cars, more human-built things. And even though all these birds here that I brought today were obviously probably hit by cars, have wing injuries, that's not the only thing that hurts birds of prey. Uh, I have a, another hawk I'm training for programs that's missing part of one of his wings because somebody shot him. So it used to be that people would shoot birds of prey because they were afraid of them, they thought that they would hurt you or hunt your livestock or something. So they'll shoot birds of prey. You notice uh, against the law do that. Uh, sometimes you'll find a bird of prey that's flown into a window of a building or something like that because they don't recognize what glass is. That happens a lot. Uh, a couple years back, I got in a peregrine falcon for rehabilitation. It was, it, was, it was diving to the ground trying to catch something in the air, but it hit a power line in midair, and it suffered a, wing, a back injury that ended up being fatal. Because if you're flying, diving 200 miles an hour, you think you're going to notice a little power cable about that big when you're focused on something you're trying to eat? Probably not. But birds of prey have been electrocuted on power lines. They've been shot. Uh, they Just all kinds of things. So uh, also, I have a great horned owl that I've had for many years, and his problem is he can't be released because he's found hanging in a barbed wire fence. And it tore up all the tendons and wing muscles in his wing. So almost always as a wildlife rehabilitator, when I see an injured bird of prey, it's almost always something that man has produced, done, or something. I've almost never seen a bird of prey that, that flew into a snag in a tree and cut itself and punctured itself or something like that, you know. It, it's almost always something man-made. So, you know, if you're building fences, consider something other than barbed wire. If you're putting up big giant glass windows, consider putting something there to break up the outline so birds know it's something they can't fly. Power lines have sometimes been uh, modified so that big birds like eagles don't land on and touch wires and complete a circuit and get electrocuted. You know, uh, we can't do much about power lines stretch out that birds can sometimes fly into. But uh, it's something we need to think about. And, and, and all these birds get hit by cars. Maybe we had more wild areas set aside they wouldn't have to hunt beside the highway. And, so, and at least we can drive a little slower and, and be a little bit more cautious for animals like that that are nearby. Yes, another question. Could a bald eagle be, be as long as that stick? Could be as long as that, as wingspan? Sure could. Because I'm like six feet tall, and uh, so I'm taller than this is, so a wingspan of an eagle could be that tall. Yeah, or even more if it's a big eagle. Yes? Uh, I do not have a bald eagle, no, no. My permits are for these other types of birds, but I don't have a, uh, bald eagles take special permits and special facilities for them. Yeah. Yes? Why are they afraid of uh, owls? Why, why are? Why are they afraid of owls? I've always been told, like, if you have a hawk problem with your chickens, you can set an owl out and uh -huh. take them away and vice versa. Okay, well, sometimes people put out, uh, you know, an owl decoy or something like that to scare away other animals because they're predatory, but a lot of times it doesn't work. <laughs> they did it. I was just curious Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, hawks normally aren't afraid of owls, but, you know, bigger birds of prey will eat smaller birds of prey. So uh, they will be afraid of something that's bigger than they are and be cautious about something about that. Yes? I put out one of those owls uh -huh. to protect our blackberries. Uh -huh. And it's got the rotating gear. Right. And 
a, a little house room, a very tiny one. Just right, yeah. Yes, yeah, kind of yeah, sometimes little birds are like, like little dogs. It seems like they're not afraid of anything. But, uh, you know, sometimes birds, you know, will what, do what we call mobbing behavior, particularly crows. They'll find a great horned owl sitting and they'll come in big numbers and try to scare the bird away because they're afraid that it might be a predator on their young and stuff like that. Or sometimes you'll, sometimes you'll see a crows chasing a red-tailed hawk in the sky, you know, and that kind of stuff. They usually do that in numbers, and red-tailed hawks are not nimble enough. Uh, nimble enough to capture something out of mid-air, you know, and, and they're just been bu bullied, you know, like that. And, and great horned owls are bullied by, uh, pestered by crows. They just kind of close their eyes and go to sleep, and then a uh, uh, hawks kind of, uh, I mean, the crows kind of give up and go away and all that stuff. But you know, smaller birds are often afraid of bigger birds and will sometimes take a chance in an effort to run them away because they have a nest nearby and that kind of stuff, and they're afraid that they're going to be a predator. So sometimes you'll see a very brave bird doing something like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yes. So we cannot legally have a feather or a bird of prey. Uh, if we find, uh, I don't hit it, but if, if you find one on the road, how can we protect it so it can get up to bring it to Yeah, so if you find an injured bird of prey, be very careful, wrap a blanket around or something like that, get in a box, don't watch out for his talons, stuff like that, and then you, you're, 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 you're allowed to capture something like that and then find help for it. Yeah, so uh, you usually get on the internet for your state, go to the State Fish and Game Commission for your state, and you'll find out the wildlife rehabilitators that are in your area that are permitted to work with animals like that. So you're allowed to do something like that, but just you're not allowed to take it home, keep it, and say, I'm going to rehabilitate this bird and keep it and stuff like that, and then you could get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes? Um, I had two. One time there was a bird on my window. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, there's a girlfriend, mm -hmm. but he kept pecking right there, and I got to um, learn about it. Yeah, sometimes they see the reflection of wind, and songbirds trying to chase away the, the, the another bird, but it's just their own reflection they're seeing. About an owl, when we were going on vacation, I think I saw a great horned owl mm -hmm. up there in the trees. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, I bet you. Yeah, they are. Okay, so I'm going to bring the program to close here. If anybody likes to stay and talk a little bit more about birds to pray, got more questions, I'll be glad to answer your questions. But thanks for coming out to Hunters in the Sky. Hope you enjoyed the program. Hope you learned something about these animals. And just uh, go out and look for them. They are around. Not as common as other birds, but they are there. They are here to be found. And they are the most amazing creatures that we share the earth with. So thank you for coming out. You're welcome.